And uh, the other barrel for yeah, this is the first one that's 10 minutes away from me. Hello, so, everyone, hear me okay online? Yeah. Good, okay. Sorry, you kind of got here. Yes, go ahead. Does someone have something to say? Yeah, okay. Um, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're pretty much um, just at the time, so thank you all for being here. Um, it looks like we have a lot of people joining online. Um, so the plan for this um, is a little kind of different than what we've done before, but Ezra is here and he's going to share um, some technology that we have um, in this room that's set up. So this is the OWL camera, is that correct? So that is the camera that you're hearing and seeing us on right now. Um, so he's going to take a few minutes and demo that and just talk about some different options of like how to facilitate this kind of environment where you might have people joining uh, both in person and um, online live in real time. Um, so I'm gonna uh, hand it over to him. And then after that, I have some questions for our panelists. And at that time, I'll let each person take a chance and, and introduce themselves. So thank you all for being here. So I'll share the desktop and just show you some of the controls for this OWL camera, but it's a 360 degree camera with the microphone and we've mounted this one in the ceiling. We put it in here uh, about six weeks ago and just got some feedback. There were too many cords. So we bought the oh. mounts to put it up in the ceiling. You can mount it on a tripod as well. And then there's a whiteboard option um, that does whiteboard capture if you want to incorporate that as well. So we, that's an add-on for like an additional $500. So we, we bought that module to try it out. Here's the oh, uh, so we've got this installed here, and then there's a room over in the mansion 208 where we've got an owl cam set up for testing. Uh, and you can use a mobile app, but there's also a desktop app that's installed at the instructor stations, and it's got um, an option to just focus the camera, so I can just focus it on me, and zoom in. Uh, can you see the owl app? As oh, yeah. Manipulate the camera online. And uh, so you can focus it if you are standing in one place or just want to show like a guest speaker or something. And then you can turn that off and then uh, use the 360 degree option. And you'll see in the webcam video feed from this room, there's at the top just the 360 degree. And then it's it's auto focusing on my voice, and that's kind of detected Lisa as a potential speaker. But if if, if, if more people talk, um, it'll it'll create more boxes. And then it's got an option where if you click here, it would just follow the presenter. So I, if I keep talking, hopefully it will follow me just across the room. A little my time, but it'll catch up to me. And uh, so it's you don't have to manually do that or adjust it from the computer and just will follow the voices. And then if somebody else just starts talking in the room, it would add them as a speaker and just focus on that. Uh, hello, can you see me? Oh, look at that. Oh, I see me. Yeah, it'll come down this way maybe if we keep talking. 
copy it probably just takes a little while. Interesting. So not not a hundred percent accurate, but pretty close where it's 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 it hurt you, it just couldn't find you. But maybe if you talk more, I would have how does it know that that's not on that spot? Oh, well, this is on a sign in for here. Oh, yeah. okay. That's yeah. coming from HD meeting, not from the all can. I know, right? <laughs> And then there's also a, a option here to ignore a zone. So if there were like some area where people are walking into the classroom, you could ignore that. So it doesn't just automatically focus to the students who are showing up five minutes late to class or something like that. Um, so you could, you could do that, but no, you turn off the zone. Um, yeah, so that's that's the all camp. So we had discussions about buying a better camera for classrooms that we have some um, of the Go to room cameras, which, but they're just a single view camera as well. Like, like we've got the little webcams in almost every classroom. We've got um, some of the larger cameras that it can show a bigger picture and a bigger room, like in the ELC Lectorium and uh, other larger rooms. But they don't have the find me, follow me type thing when, when a presenter's talking and they don't have a 360 degree view. So if you had a small seminar class, like 12 people, and you had one of these owls in the center, and somebody joined online, you'd be able to see everybody as they're talking, see their kind of reactions and things, and then you could see the, the guests online on a screen. Um, but that's, that's kind of the design. And it works fairly well in a room this large, but again, if, if I'm talking as the instructor, and then a couple students talk, it might not really capture them close up kind of show like we just saw Stacy talking that it, it kind of showed the back of the room but okay. we'll focus on, on here. Does it do anything to enhance the sound uh, like someone in the classroom is speaking or is that is no I mean it, it's got a better microphone than some things now the, the ones the, the go to room devices we have have a fairly good microphone but um, or if you're like basic small USB webcams the the microphone's really just whoever's in front of it. It, it. These are kind of designed not to pick up somebody in another room, so it's really more directional and who's in front of that, that little webcam. Can we bring Ian in to tell us how it sounds when we're speaking? Sure. I'll stop sharing my screen. Ian, we're putting you on the spot to give us feedback on how we sound and look. Great audio. You sound great to me. Interesting. Oh, they're saying it hurt me as well as Ezra. So <laughs> they can't, you know, I thought the sound was probably enhanced, especially if, uh, you know, if it's going to fall. And better. it's designed to, for 18 feet. So it's basically going to pick up everything where they're seating in this room. Now, why is it focusing over why here? Yeah, she's the one who's stopped. Adam, your question. Might be <laughs> Maybe just because I'm closer to the camera that it's just. Looks like it's looking for more people. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I okay. wonder sometimes, too, the sound is not real clear where the sound's coming from, so it just goes to the closest person, probably. So, can you tell us what all rooms you said? So well, obviously right now we've room. got an owl cam in Rag 300 and then one in the Mansion 208. Okay. And then we have um, the go to room in the Lectorium and the Third Street uh, 116 and then the Mansion 206. And we've got additional cameras we could deploy in other rooms that are the go to room system. Okay. We just haven't installed yet. And and so is the go to room the one that would you would just still sit on the table, but you would have a wider view? Okay. Yeah. So if people were interested in using that, they could just if, if not in one of these rooms, they could reach out to you to request that. Yeah, if, if you have if you say I have the webcam in my room, I mean we we uh, haven't had time to deploy all the go to rooms. Um, we wanted to put a few in each building. We just got okay. a three out so far. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's definitely good feedback from anybody that they want a better camera system or microphone in the room. That would be where we want to go with next. Okay. Is that one's in the library electrolyte? The library electrolyte has just a, it's
it's just a Logitech webcam, okay. but it's it's a little oh, bit it's higher. Nice. It's got a stand and a, a base with a speaker and a better microphone. Okay. So that's just a higher end, like a $600. So the GoPro is actually better than that? It's better. It's got, but it's a lot more uh, parts and pieces. <laughs> yeah, okay. so it's it's better. And the other thing with the go to room that may or not may not be a benefit is it can the way it's got a touch panel and you can set the meeting up on the room so the there's a, there's a calendar for the room and you can just set meetings and then somebody walks in and just clicks start the meeting and it just starts the meeting so that's what's all it's got its own like license to go to meeting but it can be connected to hg meeting or zoom or teams as well but it, if you just go to meeting for a meeting it, it can be the meeting host and then anybody can walk in and start the meeting and then there's even a button for screen share within there where you can go to a laptop and go to a, a web address and then share your screen to the whole meeting wirelessly so this brings me to a question i was going to ask you earlier you walk us through what you needed to do the minute you walked through the door to make this happen yeah, yeah that would be really helpful yeah well, uh, in here, uh, I walked in, I uh, turned the computer on, I logged in, and I opened up HD meeting, and then it detected. It could be Zoom or yeah, it could be Zoom. Um, it detected the Owl meeting camera okay. automatically because it's already plugged in USB in this room. Okay. And then uh, I turned on video, and it just there for a, a, a few seconds, 15, 20 seconds maybe. There was the blue owl logo as it like because it's got a lot of ai in it to do all that stuff just started itself up because it, uh, and then it was ready to go um and that's it and then it sounds so it's, it's connected now then the adjustments i made were just opening that app on the desktop uh -huh. to have that owl app open to focus the camera or change the settings if i had different things and i know deshaun's been using it a little bit in the mansion so he's he's done that thing where he just focuses it on the whiteboard or something just where he's going to be standing so it doesn't follow all the students and all the background noise around the room the, the camera in mansion is, is is very great uh i do like it however i do like to point out that the camera for the whiteboard is it's not that good i i don't know how to use that uh, i would just use a big one the big owl in the center put it in the center and it would record it, but the the, the camera for a whiteboard is just not something that uh, that I personally like. It I had problem with it, technical problem. So, so but that's just me. I hope and anybody. I, we had noticed in that room that the whiteboard um, it tries to do like a green screen effect on the whiteboard, where oh. you, when the professor's instructor is standing in front of the the whiteboard, it like phases you out so you can see the writing behind the instructor. But in that room, the whiteboard, the contrast off of the glare from the outside was, was messing with that feature. So it was kind of like phasing out all the text and all that. So that was that was just some Tyler did some troubleshooting on that. And we, so rooms with a lot of light. <laughs> and this is another yeah, one nice, that's yeah. not gonna be that was another question I was gonna ask, yeah. what do we do about this? Because at 6 p.m. it's even worse. Yeah, I mean, sun, what they've done in the other sun. rooms, I don't know why there's just blinds on two windows, but that, that's really the only thing you can do in a room like this is add more blinds. Who would we request that from? Uh, Chris Hart. Okay. We can talk to Chris about it. Okay. And, um, but yeah, that that's always, I mean, that's going to be a, a problem for the projector, for the people watching. Somebody down in 107 has put up those rice paper screens in the windows. That was facilities. That's why I could that talk to Chris Hart. Like, yeah. So you still get a little bit of light, but, but it, yeah, they they, they went and purchased those that material just to block out the, the sun from that side of the building. Yeah. 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 I was gonna ask you, Ezra, if they I know you have these mounted and that's probably best, but is it uh, what would be the feasibility of like having one or two of these cameras that you could, I mean, are they easy to, enough to set up that you could yeah, move well, them from one to There's a couple things you could do. One, it, it just comes with a basic tripod mount, so you could just mount it on a tripod if you didn't have anywhere else to put it. But if you had like a large conference table, it could go in the center of a conference table 
And then just being mindful of ports and things that could go, it's mobile enough that you can move it from room to room and all that. Yeah. The I'm only just... thing that is a little bit extra work is that you want to, you can use a mobile app to control it. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you didn't have it installed, but having the, the mobile app or the software installed on the computer, if you're just going room to room, it might be best to try using the mobile app. Um, but unless it just goes on the USB, it's got its own power cable too. So there's power cord and the USB to the laptop or computer is hooked up to. Yeah, because I thought that might be an option. Um, you know, if we had one that if people really needed it in a certain length of time, that was, wasn't going to be used all the time. Yeah, if there was one that was kind of like a, that wasn't designated to a room, but that could be requested kind of like the other go-to room campus. Okay. I'm just going to show the yeah, whiteboard. So yeah, so when you flip that tile, it just goes to whiteboard mode and then somebody can draw on the whiteboard. If you walk in, just at the front of Yeah. And that those tiles just designate the zone. I looked earlier, I don't think we even have any then primary markers. markers anymore. <laughs> we <laughs> used to move ours from room to room because when you went back there. But if you were literally right on there, it would. Yeah. And then it, yeah. So you just draw and then it, it would be recorded with your meeting recording, the whiteboard session, or just to, um, so you don't know, just totally fade it out. And what's the advantage of that versus just writing on the whiteboard and the camera's pointing? Well, this this would really be helpful if you were like maybe doing a math class where you're all you're doing is writing on the board the whole okay. lecture and and then you can it just focuses on directly on the whiteboard and then when you need to go back to the other camera view, you just flip the tile and then it so just, just really something like maybe like <laughs> chemistry class or a math class where there's lots of whiteboard writing. Not a lot of lecture or graduate classes do that kind of thing, but something like that. And that way, the students at home get basically the kind of experience that they would get if they were sitting in the room looking at the whiteboard and answering questions and following along with the problem. So that's right. Yeah, so we need to invest the money in a lot of the whiteboard things. We could just get the cameras. Is that tile uh, on the board in 208 as well? Yes, there's a tile in, 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 one, in opposite corners, and um, they've got a pattern on them. So when the pattern on the tiles doesn't match, it's whiteboard on. And then when it matches, it's whiteboard off. So it's oh. Tetris type thing on. OK. Excellent, you, thanks. So it's back on again? Yeah. So does the whiteboard show up? It looks backwards. Oh, yeah. So you would need to go into uh, your settings and on HDMI, uh, make sure okay. you don't have mirror on. Sometimes okay. that mirror is on just by default. So when you're moving your hands, you know which side is uh, doing that. But yeah, that was the only issue there. I didn't realize that was a feature in HDMI. Yeah. But you can yeah, see there's a little. Just, I mean, and you would maybe you wouldn't project onto the whiteboard either, like we're doing. So it, it, it's kind of messing with it a little bit that we're projecting onto the whiteboard at the same time as we're filming it. But, so that that's a lot of the owl cam. It's it's um, cool, and yeah, we can we can get more of these for next year in the budget we're building, so we can buy some more of these owl cams. And, uh, How other. much are the owl cams? Um, I think it was like twelve hundred dollars for the all cam. Yeah. So you're sold on this. I mean, I'm sold on getting maybe like five or six more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with the money that we have. <laughs> well, so, and yeah. one of the reasons, I mean, this is nursing and social work in this room, but another thing that happens in here is continuing education for the community, and it creates a space where we can do a lot more reach with revenue generating classes. So yeah, it's perfect for this. Stuff. And it's kind of, it's just nice that it's out of the way to apply they have the option to mount it on the ceiling. And yeah, for me, this, this whiteboard feature solves a lot of the problems in my classes because my classes are a hybrid uh, where I have students seated and I also have students 
uh, attending online at the same time. And so I need everybody to see the same whiteboard. Uh, so this solves that problem. But I get moved from room to room, uh, depending on where my classes are placed. So if there is no consistency with the placement of the OWL cam, sometimes I'll be able to use it and sometimes I won't. So one thing we can do, we've done this for, there's all kinds of classrooms that have special features. And so when you put in your schedule, um, you could identify like classes that need a Mac lab or a computer lab. Jennifer Goldman has that list. So we could uh, give her the list once we purchase more of the rooms that have them and then you can request them. And um, that, that way she would give you priority if you had requested a room with an owl cam or a whiteboard cam so that you can get that. And that's, that's probably the best thing we can do. I don't know that there's really a lot of competition for classrooms like in the schedule next year time-wise. Like I, I think you'd probably get it, um, but without Jennifer having a little knowledge of what your needs are, that she might just move you around like you said. So I think if you tell her I need this room, because basically I one case we have John Wilcox always teaches in the same room. And she just knows, I think he puts on his, all his classes, they put on there like 205 and he just gets mentioned 205 for all his classes. So I, you know, Jennifer can help with that. There was a chat question from Eric. I wonder if you could oh, okay. respond to that. Is there the hello? It looks like hello is written on the board. On my screen, it looks very faint. Is it possible that in live that you can actually just write something on the board? Because I'm kind of wondering what the clarity would look like um, if the professor was writing on the board. If is I can't tell if that hello is 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 marker that's kind of faint, or if it's my screen, or if that's just the clarity of what we would see on the owl. On our, like, how does it look now? We turned the projector off. Did it make it a little bit easier to see? And then, yeah, the marker is not that great. That's one issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a light marker. It's not a, yeah. So that, it's a little well, bit of that. Now that the projector's off. Well, and then these windows are reflecting straight onto, so like, I'm not seeing part of the flow because it's lit up with the windows. So yeah. this roof setup is not high. Yeah. So there's a little glare even without the projector on, but uh, so it's a little thing. Could you take that one and you know put it someplace could, and then move those tile thingies onto that? Yeah, you could twist that to point it in a different direction. I okay. mean, and then just point it at a mobile whiteboard, or if there was a room where there, there's multiple whiteboards, you could pick which whiteboard to go Sweet. and okay. try to avoid the, the glare. So for the whiteboard, you have to have a tile in each corner like that? And it's, it scales to whatever size the whiteboard okay. is, up to a maximum. I think this is getting close to its maximum, but I think it was 18 feet. And when you maximum. say twist, Well, that, in like this room, it would just be or? like, you'd have to actually like reach up and move that. Yeah, it's on a little mount that's got, it, that's okay. got some play to it. But, it is clear. I think it was the marker that was the issue. Um, now on my screen, it is very clear. We did have the projector on, so that was washing it out for sure, but now the projector's off. Thank you. All right. Did you have some something else? The only else? other, what came up in one of our previous conversations was using the, and I don't necessarily need to go through the whole demo of this, but I did have um, a couple laptops here. We, if you use the rooms feature of HD meeting or Zoom for group activities, what we talked about was using that um, where you paired or grouped people in the classroom with people online joining remotely, um, just so that they don't feel disengaged. So you could go one of two ways, I guess. Everybody online could be in their own room and they have that online experience, but if some students have their own devices in the room. They could join the group uh, from their laptop and then have people remotely join. So I was going to show that more, but with the majority of people online, it's not like there's much to show. So, so can you also do that with Windstream or is that just a... You can do that with Zoom or Windstream. Okay. The breakout rooms is a feature of both. So when you, and that's just when you create a room Software, you can put the projector back on. Okay. 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 Okay.
So, yeah, that breakout room. So you just yeah. you would just assign manual, you know, assign your groups manually, and just knowing who's if somebody was out and joining remotely that day, pair them with some people. And if you had pre-assigned groups, and you know, for the whole semester, and somebody was going to be off, maybe just having like some somebody in each group bring in their own laptop so that you could do that. But it really does require students to bring a device in. You know, I would, would recommend it that we try to borrow laptops or do that just because there's a lot of logistical issues in, in planning that. And walk us through that if you have more than one device in the same room that's open. Yeah, so that was what I what I did with these laptops in here is I just joined them, and so you you can see Ian and Nikki on the laptops, but I joined those chose phone as the audio option. So it's doing the video, but there's no phone, no built-in microphone attached to the their login to HD meeting. So it's not creating feedback or echoing because it, it thinks they dialed in by a phone, but they didn't really dial in by phone. So if we did a small group breakout, we wanted to take Ricky with us <laughs> into yeah. our group. What would we do with the sound? To be able to just hear yeah. one another in our small group. Well, it, it just depends on um, how big the room is. But you just have to space out, and you use the the microphone and built into the laptop to have that group discussion, and you'd be talking to the laptop and hearing from the laptop. But that could be overheard by other groups. But the same as in person groups could make extra noise. You know? Sure, but yeah. if you have like somebody else taking in to another form of yeah. And you open up the microphones. Aren't you going to get feedback? Well, you want to make sure they were in different rooms. That's the that would be what you know. Okay. That would be the, the thing to avoid that kind of feedback. Is if you're using the breakout rooms and they the people online, people who have laptops are all in different rooms, or they just only one person in the room joins each each in the physical room joins the virtual room. So you don't if you had two devices joined. The virtual room in the in the same physical space, you get feedback. Yeah. But they could just mute themselves too to affect us. Okay. I am occasionally. This is a HD meeting question. I'm sorry, not a <laughs> camera question. But I've occasionally had students that did not show up on the list in order to be able to put them in the breakout room. Um, I I think that what is happening there is that they. Um, didn't come in through the app. They came in some other way. But oh, if um, they join through the browser, they can't use the rooms feature. Yes, I think that's what happened. Ah, so that is important to know because I, I remember when we first went online for some of the first um, classes I had that were live and I was trying to do breakout rooms, I would have a group of students that weren't eligible for the breakout rooms. So I would just have to leave them in the main room. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's important to tell them to come in from the app. You know. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. The other thing that I've done is have the student who's not in person share a cell phone number in the next small group and just call that person yeah. on speaker, and that avoids going through this system. But by adding the device, you can see that person as well. Which is nice. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if, did you have anything else? Or I think that's probably a good um, opportunity for us to move on to our panel questions. So, um, unless did anyone online have any other questions for Ezra before we do that? Just to be sure. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so um, again, thank you all for being here. I'm going to give you each a chance to just introduce yourselves. Didi, if you want to go first. <laughs> I'm Didi Wolfram that I came to learn as much as I did to share, but I'm just delighted to be here. <laughs> okay, and then we also have Nikki and Ian. If Nikki, you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, and I echo Didi that I came to learn as much as to share my experiences. Thank you. And I'm Ian Vandeventer from the School of Business. Uh, like everyone else, I'm here to learn. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, is it okay if I 
stay sitting here. Can you all still see and hear okay? It seemed like the audio was good. So, um, okay. And I have a few questions. We'll just kind of see um, what all we, we get to on here. And I'll just go um, through these. And this is kind of based on where we hold the faculty to see, like, what are some of the challenges that you face or, you know, what would you like to know more about uh, navigating this type of environment uh, with students? So the first question was um, asking about like when you're hosting a, a class like this, where you've got people live in real time attending virtually um, and in person, um, how do you keep both groups engaged and participating in class? That's our first first question for everyone wants to get back. I'm happy to start. Um, I think that even with all of the technology that we have, for example, a 360 degree camera, there I have to manage my own expectations that it is very difficult uh, to manage um, high flex or concurrent teaching. Um, but um, you know, thinking about the questions, there are a few things that um, last, I think last semester or the, the semester before is when I first had the experience of teaching a hybrid blended format, because typically it's you either teach synchronously or you're teaching in person. So planning had, was number one, just making sure that um, I anticipated technical challenges and that we had a plan in mind, um, that that plan was articulated to students, um, and um, making sure the students received all of the information ahead of time, emailing it to them. Um, so if we were doing group work, um, expectations around participation, um, also emphasizing an equitable accessibility plan, which means for me taking a remote first approach to ensure online students are included and they can participate in all activities. Um, one big challenge that I have because I speak fast is really slowing down discussions and pacing of the class to just, like I said, to make sure everybody can participate and they're engaged. Um, being very uh, intentional about directly and equally checking in with students that are logging in online versus students who are like right in front of me in person. Um, and I think there's a question about breakouts but I did want to say something um, in this portion of the, the questions that I try to aim for equivalency because I do and, and I teach predominantly in the DSW program and our doctoral program. And so, you know, at that level, a lot of it's knowledge creation, it's very much student directed. And so we do a lot of group, group works and group work. And just like in this setting right now, most of the people are online, that tends to be the case. Also, when you're teaching, most of the students are logging in from home. Um, so integrating, um, aiming for equivalency in groups, and so integrating students that are in person, online, or vice versa. So asking folks to log in from their phone and participating um, with students virtually, um, uh, if there's a small number, either in person or online. And as I said, I think that the 360 camera can be helpful to address some of the barriers of a static camera. Um, but the big thing is really managing my expectations Lower my stress level, knowing it's not going to be perfect. That's not the aim. Um, just making sure the students have a good experience and everybody's participating as much as possible. Okay. Anybody else? Um, okay, so actually you kind of mentioned that um, the next question is about sharing class materials. And so you mentioned, Nikki, that you will email materials out ahead of time. And that was something that had come up when we had told faculty as well. But I don't know if um, TD or Ian have any, um, any other suggestions or, um, or if that, if you really think, uh, I mean, emailing ahead of time seems like a good so I solution to that. learned by messing up <laughs> that um, if I have like a PowerPoint presentation, I need to put that on Canvas because the whiteboard experience or whatever may not be 
uh, able to, those are students who zoom in, may not be able to see stuff, but if they have it right there on Canvas, they can pull up my PowerPoint, they can see the slide or the, whatever they need. Mm -hmm. So that helps. So, yeah. Ian, what do you have? And Nikki, I'm sure you have some other I was going to say the same thing. Uh, I would either, depending on what it is, uh, I would either email it to the class or an individual person. Uh, as I've had students request me to send them information in class in order to pull it up because they're having difficulty getting in Canvas or something. Uh, so I'll email it to them real quick and they'll pull it up from their email. Uh, but most of the time I would provide the, uh, provide the materials in Canvas so that everybody uh, can access it. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I use um, that I have an area in Canvas where I uh, disseminate information that we're gonna be using in class. And one thing that I failed to mention is that for high, high flex classes, I most certainly use a flipped classroom approach where when students are coming to class, it's all discussion-based, uh, questions driven by the students, group group based, and so um, there's pre work that they're doing before they get into class, and all of that information is housed on the learning management system. So I echo what everybody else has said. Yeah, I personally have had some um, some cases where students have had trouble maybe like finding or locating something, and so what I've tended to do sometimes recently, especially when I'm synchronously online is have some links that I've saved, like if it's gonna be a collaborative document or something, so that I can just quickly and easily copy and paste that into the chat. So I don't know if that, that's a helpful idea for some people too, but um, just in the event that it's needed. Does anybody know, I think in Zoom you can put an attachment in the chat box that can be opened up on the other end. But I'm, yes. I'm not aware that that's possible in Zoom, not accurate. One of those features that somebody should try. Do you have an answer to that one, Ezra? Or somebody should try it. Yeah. Um, Can anybody attach a document? Go ahead, attach a document. We challenge no, you. I don't All think. Mine. I don't think. I think you're right, Stacy, that it's not turned on. I don't know if it's like a. I can research that. I know it's a feature in Zoom, but yeah. I don't know yeah. if, it's a, if it is just turned off. And it'd be great to have that. Yeah. You could definitely do a link to. So like a Dropbox file or yeah, or SharePoint, SharePoint or Canvas. Canvas. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, moving on to the next question and uh, kind of thinking about again the engagement piece. Um, there was a lot of questions about like how do you utilize uh, the chat or the reaction features in HD meeting to, to help with that engagement. Um, if you use those, what kind of tips or suggestions do you have about using those? And then, sorry, this is a loaded, I guess, multiple part question, but the other piece of that that I have too is um, just what are some tips that you might have about how to best manage the chat, um, you know, to help, to help keep both sets of audiences I guess for me, and this is not perfect, right? I really do encourage people to chat all the way through class and keep, if, as long as it's connected to class content, chat away, react away. I really like how this is. I've never seen this before because then everyone in the class can read the chats, whether they're virtual or face to face. So that's super awesome. Now, other things that I've done that I don't, I'm not trying to be, again, all this perfect on this, but I do a lot. So this is my usual thing. I have a class of like 16 to 20 people, and at the last minute, Three to four of them say, I got tested, I can't come, or whatever else. And so I'm like, scramble, scramble. Okay. So, what I've learned to do for me that works is I bring my laptop fully charged to class. I open the Zoom meeting. I used to put people, like I said, I have three or four. I used to do a small breakout group for them, but then I don't like that because you know how you have to do the breakout groups closing in one minute, blah, 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 blah. I'm, you know, you try to read the room, and the, these people are like, no, we need to come back now. Like, they're, they're done. So now I just keep them in the main room if I have three or four and I'll put them in a breakout room and I just mute ourselves and mute them. So they're in their, the main space, but then I can bring them back real quick. I'm going to waste some time. And then if I have like one or two zooming in, then I literally like, and this is not perfect, Ezra, so that's 
<laughs> but I just literally moved the laptop. I mean, because it's our charge, there's no cords, right? I'm just like, hey, you're in the group with Stacy and Donna. You go participate, right? And that seems like it works pretty well for the, the online people generally like it and the face-to-face -face people do. But um, again, I'm interested in other folks what works. I can hey, put a laptop on a chart so you can just wheel it. And you all people too, experts out there, you just chat some of your ideas as we're listening to Yeah, today. definitely. Love to hear what everyone else says. I'm gonna put that in the chat. Nick Keenan, how do you manage all of that? I don't use chats very much in my classes. I monitor the chats in case somebody online has a question. Uh, that's about it for me. You can turn the chat off when you set up the meeting if you want people to speak instead of avoiding speaking in class. But... Introverts are mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say one of the things I've done is just ask a student to monitor the chat for me. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So, you know, just kind of assign them and I'll rotate it and say, would you watch the chat today if any questions come up, with, you know, that I miss or that I don't see? Because um, sometimes it is, it depends on the group as to how chatty they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that uh, ability to turn the chat? off and on, do you have to do that before you start or can you toggle it during the meeting? It's before you start, when you create the meeting link, you just, that's one of the long list of things you can uh, customize. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And one of the other things too I'll mention is that when you join a meeting, so if a student comes in late, they can't see anything in the chat. Yes. The chat. Yeah. So that's important to that's too, is that come like and we'll see the previous chat. That'd be a feature, it, I wish that would change. Yeah. yeah. The, depending on how you, you, I mean, one thing you can do is at the end, you can save the chat transcript and post that somewhere so they can catch up later. That's a lot of extra work. <laughs> I think some of the ethics of chat yeah. should be like elicited too, because that speaks to students may not realize that the chat is going to be safe, right? And even if they're writing a private message to somebody else, the instructor is going to see that. And I think, you know, just be warned, be fair, you know, you should know that. Um, the other thing that I've literally had happen in class is a student who's sick at home using the chat to tell me how he's feeling in real time yeah. and not thinking about you're on the you're on the board. We're all seeing that. So um, I think just you know orienting people to how this all works. It does save the chat, like whoever logs in gets it yeah. saved on their computer. Which is usually the that's something, also something that students might need to be made aware of in case they're using resolve the world and there's just chats saved yeah okay um okay so the next question is kind of looking at um more about again getting students engaged and using games or other activities again if you think about having this kind of format where people are joining both um virtually and in the classroom. So um, two part question. The first part is what advice do you have for implementing um, games or other activities in this kind of um, environment? And then um, do you have any that you just really like that you would recommend? I guess I can start that one. Um, I like to use games uh, in my classes to try to make the topics uh, as um, interesting as possible, if not uh, to try to include some fun activity in the class. Uh, so one of the important things to do is to make sure that whatever game you're using is easily accessible to everyone. Uh, if you have a hybrid class with seated and online people, the online games then tend to work best. So you wanna make sure that there's no subscription or fee to that. Uh, and that if there is some sort of sign up, even if it's free, if they have to sign up for it, that the students are aware of that. Um, then you also want to test the game, make sure that you've played the game all the way through yourself so that you don't have any surprises show up in class, uh, that kind of thing. Um, then I would make sure that you announce to class uh, if when the session starts or well before you're going to use the game in class, uh, that they're going to be using a game and be expected to access it uh, so that they can have that ability. 
I usually encourage my seated uh, students to bring their laptop to class with them so that everyone uh, who is attending virtually and seated uh, can do the activity at the same time on their own computer. Uh, and then I will uh, also sometimes pull up the computer on the overhead. So I'm gonna see if this will work. Will this allow me to share my screen? Can everybody see my screen? So one of my favorite games to pull yes. up and use in my accounting classes is called the lemonade stand. So if you just Google cool math lemonade stand, and it's usually the top uh, item on the Google search and just click that. Uh, it runs through a, a quick little advertisement. They have to make their money somehow since the game is free. So you just wait till the ad is finished and click skip ad when it gives you the opportunity. And that brings you to this page, uh, which is an introduction to the lemonade stand game. You can use seven, 14 or 30 day option. I usually tell the students to all choose the seven day option so that it doesn't take the entire class period to play the game. Uh, and then it walks you through the tutorial of the game. So this is geared more toward, uh, since you're running a lemonade stand and you have to be aware of the cost of all of your ingredients and set your prices. Uh, this goes along really well with my accounting classes, particularly cost accounting. And then I usually have students uh, save their financial information at the end so that they can create their financial statements the income statement, statement of retained earnings and the balance sheet. Uh, and if there's time allows, I might even run through a demonstration of the class, of the game in class. There's also a cool math coffee shop. Those are the only two games I use. I don't know if there's anything on cool math that would, that other people might use, uh, but this is one of my favorite tools to use when I'm using a game in class. Uh, let me see if I can remember how to unshare this. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I feel like I shouldn't say that anymore. Very well. Yeah, I mean, everybody's using their phone, and it, it just works well. sometimes try to join in the different ones, but if you have a large class, then that can be kind of time consuming and, and then you feel like you don't get to the last group until they're almost done. So I don't know if you have any um, tips or suggestions about how to, to manage those rooms to make sure everyone's on task and participating. One thing I do is make everybody submit their group work to Canvas so that it wastes if you don't get to talk about each group saying everybody can see what they did. I'm just using a discussion. Oh, right. Right. You guys hear him? You're really quiet. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like frogging my throat, but yeah. Whenever I've used breakout rooms, and I'm thinking most specifically um, this spring, the early part of the spring with my um, teaching skills course, I've always found it to be very helpful to make sure that all, diff all the different are doing something differently. Um, 
that every group is doing, like I usually have a larger project and every group is doing a small piece of that project and bringing that back to, um, to the larger group to share their expertise. And again, you know, I'm working with these doctoral students. And so that's a big part of their learning experience. I also, ahead of time, um, um, I, uh, identify folks for specific roles, such as a group facilitator. And for example, I had a large syllabus project and each student facilitates, I identified students in the class when I'm familiar with students, I'll identify specific students, of course, will rotate to be, to be the facilitator in that breakout room. And then we just kind of sent emails back and forth with they have the entire project, the aim of the project. And we talked about things to, to anticipate while I'm also going to the breakout rooms, but they pretty much had a handle on, on the facilitation piece. Um, and um, when I, of course, when I don't know students, I'll often randomly assign students um, to, to be the facilitator. Um, and I think that, I know we're uh, short on time, so I just wanna say the big takeaway for me in breakout rooms is to make sure that I check in with the students and I have enough time to, um, to have a wrap up discussion because again, if they're all working on different parts of a larger project, I want them to be able to share what they've learned with a larger group and to ask questions. And so whenever I'm using a breakout room, it's very important to make sure the students have a deliverable, that they have a problem to solve, something that they're creating to contribute. Um, because I think with discussions and group work, it can easily feel like busy work if there's not a specific goal in mind and there's not something that they can actually deliver to the larger group. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I think we are pretty much out of time. So the last question was kind of, you know, looking at um, what to do with the recording after the fact. So maybe we can get some feedback from um, some of the panelists, like via email or something, if, if we need to, to, to be able to share that with others. Um, and, and so that way we can maybe still answer that question, but we just, I don't think we have time to do it right now. Um, so thank you all for coming today. And this will be, uh, this has been recorded. So we'll send this out like usual. Um, and we're gonna try to get together kind of a list of some of the key um, key points uh, from this today, as including you know, some of those key points about how to access this technology and where it's located and all of that and plan on distributing that out to the faculty. So, so thank you, thank you all for your time. And um, I hope, hopefully you learned something useful today. Thank <laughs> you.